Man, I have loved the last few weeks together that we've been diving into this series called Everyone and really just finding these seminal moments and these themes throughout the human story, these needs that we all have. And, and I'm excited for today because I feel like it's a combination of what we sung about a second ago and, and actually how we get to choose to live that so often it's the little things that make all the biggest difference in the world. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently and he was telling me a fascinating story with one of his fighters. See, his name is Adon and he's a part of our community and he's a trainer. And he will train fighters leading up to some of the biggest fights of their life. And, and he had a really high profile client recently and, and it was going to be a fight that was really contentious. And all the build up to the fight was my friend Adon's guy that he was training, the opponent was just trying to really pull him down and really ugly, mean things, talking about this guy's fiance and people that he loved, and, and he was trying to pull him into the muck. And, and I remember talking to my friend Adon and, and just how he was trying to navigate it with his fighter, because his fighter was just angry, he was bitter. He just, he's like, when I go into that ring, like I, I, it's a boxing match, but if I have an opportunity, I'm, I'm gonna kick this guy in the face. And my boy Don is like, hey, if you do that, you'll be disqualified and you'll lose all the money, so don't do that. Like, I got a baby to feed, I need that check, all right? And you're trying to coach him on not letting this other guy pull you into the mess. But he couldn't shake it. I'm just angry. I can't believe this guy is saying this about my fiance. I can't believe he's saying this about my family. I just, I hate him. And, and this fighter had all these people in his life and other friends that just kept talking to him and screaming during training sessions. We're going to kick him in the face when he gets in the ring. We're going to spit in his face. We're going to make him pay for what he did to us. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And every time they would say something harsh and negative, my friend Adam would just come and whisper and just say, no, we're going to forgive him. We're going to step into that ring with power and we're not going to go in with hatred. We're going to go in with freedom. They just kept whispering life into him. He kept whispering truth into him. And, and then finally, the night before the fight, Adon's fighter calls him in the middle of the night and he says, I just had a crazy dream. And in this dream, I, I think it was Jesus. And this person does not believe in Jesus and, and doesn't have a relationship with Christ. And he said, I think it was Jesus. And Jesus in my dream was telling me, I need to forgive this guy. He's like, it's, it's crazy. And He's like, I'm in my room and I'm just screaming, okay, Jesus, I forgive you. He's like, I forgive you, I forgive you. And, and he tells him a friend of Don, he's like, tomorrow in that fight, I'm not going in with hatred. I'm going fully free. And, and, and they had the fight the next day and he killed him. He crushed him. He, he embarrassed him in all the right ways, not by stooping down to his level, but raising up. Because he said, there's actually another way. So what I want to take a few moments today to talk to you about is this truth. Everyone needs forgiveness. See, there are a couple things that I know about you. There's a couple things that I know are true about every single one of us. That you will need forgiveness in your life. And I also know that you will need to forgive someone in your life. But there's also a couple of things that I don't know about you. What I don't know about you is will you discover the humility that it takes to choose forgiveness? See, what I don't know about you is will you choose the humility it takes to receive forgiveness, to ask for forgiveness? Because here is the lie that we tell ourselves and that maybe society has told us is that revenge is power. But what I'm here to propose to you and I'm, what I'm here to tell you that the scriptures teach is that the most powerful aspect of who you are will always be related to forgiveness and humility. Revenge feels like power, but it's a facade. But forgiveness and humility it will actually help you unleash a power that you have yet to discover on your own. And there's a passage in John that I love that 
we get insight into this beautiful moment in the life of Jesus that gives us a marker of what forgiveness can do to the human spirit. In John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11 says this, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the oldest ones first, until only Jesus was left. He's left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one con condemned you? No one, sir. He said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. See, this is such a beautiful moment in the scriptures. You have this woman who, who has her worst moment, who, who has her darkest moment brought into the public forum. And it says that she was caught in adultery and and these religious leaders wanted to use her, wanted to use her, her weakness, wanted to use her guilt, wanted to use her shame, wanted to use her brokenness as a way to trap Jesus. And, and they parade her in front of everyone and, and they use her worst moments to try to see if they could catch Jesus slipping. And when I think about this moment, I, I'm... I'm blown away by what it must have felt like for this woman, this woman to just be completely humiliated, to be used and abused, and then to be set up like a prop for somebody else's games, the religious stories that they're trying to tell. And, and when I think about this moment, it, it also just wrestles with me. Because I've always wondered, why, Jesus, did you allow all of this to happen in the public forum? Like, like, why wouldn't you just grab her immediately, knowing the guilt that she must have felt, knowing the shame? And can't you just rush off into a private room and deal with it there? Or, or can't you get angry in the moment or, or condemn them? Why did you allow this to happen? Why would you let this woman be so humiliated unless Jesus does not See us the way that we see us. Because I think so often when it comes to forgiveness, even when it's in our own lives and we haven't forgiven ourselves, is we try to deal with all of the stuff in private. We try to deal with all the stuff in the shadows because we think that God can't handle it. We think that he can't see us in all of our nakedness and all of our shame. And he just stands there. I love in this passage, it says over and over and over again that Jesus is just standing there. See, when you try to hide from him, he's standing there. When you try to run from him, he's standing there. When you want to just be as far from God as humanly possible because of the weight of your guilt and the weight of your shame, he wants you and I to know I'm still standing here. Because he does not see us the way that we see us. And I think a huge reason that Jesus allowed this to happen publicly, the reason he allowed this woman to be humiliated and embarrassed is for this truth. That in order for you to receive the full weight of God's grace, you have to choose to live in the weight of your shame. See, we think 
shame or condemnation is supposed to oppress us. We think it's God condemning us. See, God will never allow something to come to light to shame you. It's to free you. See, every single thing in our lives that comes to the surface, every single thing that was in the shadows before but now is in the light, here's what I need you to hear from me. Whenever God allows something to come into the light, it is not to reveal your sin. It is to remove your shame. Because far too long, we have let shame paralyze us. And I think Jesus allowed this woman to completely be overwhelmed with her shame so that then she could be completely overwhelmed with his grace. And he could say, I don't see you the way that they see you. And I don't even see you the way that you see you. You are my daughter and it's time to set you free. See, I wonder how many of us are, are waiting to create the future we long for, but we haven't been able to create it yet because we're still chained to the trauma of our past. See, the moment you let go of the shame, it allows you to receive the power of his grace. And I remember moments in my life when I just felt so overwhelmed with guilt and shame. How about you? I remember far too moments that I wish to admit when, when the worst part of me rose to the surface and I made choices that were destructive or I made choices that were inflicted pain on another human being and, and there's choices that I've made that, that haunt me. How about you? But those moments can only have power in my future if I choose to be a resident of the past. And, and I remember a moment, a marker in my life when something had to shift, I, I was hurt by somebody that I thought was the closest person to me at the time. And I was in a relationship with a girl in high school. And doesn't everything feel like the end of the world in high school? And you're like, oh, my life is over. <laughs> she kissed another guy. I hate love. Right? And everything feels so weighty. And, I, and it felt so weighty. And this, my girlfriend, she kissed my, one of my best friends, who's a teammate, who, if you're wondering, we're no longer best friends. Yeah. <laughs> I had to get better friends. <laughs> but she did. And, and it really wounded me. And it, it wounded me because it validated feelings of inadequacy. It, it wounded me because I... It retold the story of you're not good enough. You're not good enough for someone to be loyal to you. You're not good enough for someone to love you. You're not good enough for someone to actually honor you and treat you with the respect that you long for. And, and, and so much of it, it wasn't really about her choice. It was about my voice. And I was wounded and I was hurt. And, and then again, I had just bad friends and bad voices. And, and we just started having conversations about how to get this girl back, right? Because when you've been hurt and when you've been wounded, what the lie will tell you is that revenge is power, that you make them feel the way that you feel. And so came up this plan to, like, get her back. And, and I don't need to get into all the details, of, but it was a choice that I was making. Of the worst part of myself was winning the story of my future and my heart and my soul. And I made a destructive choice and just to betray this girl. And I'll never forget the moment as I was about to leave because I was supposed to drive her somewhere and I was about to embarrass her and humiliate her and leave her without a ride and ha I'm gonna get you back. And, and I'm in my car and I put the car in drive and as soon as I take off, Boom, this car comes out of nowhere and nails me. And it just like shook me because it was like three seconds. It was like fast. I was like, ha ha, gotcha. And then boom, God was like, mm hmm, watch this. <laughs> and the guy gets out of the car 
And he's screaming because he had his grandkid in the car. My grandson was in my car. What are you doing? You like blippity blippity blank. All right. I'll let you fill in the blanks of what he said. And I could hear him talking, but I couldn't, I wasn't paying attention to that because I was just sitting on the curb, just crying, just crying. And I wasn't crying because of what he was saying. I was crying because of what I heard God say. I heard the core of my soul, the depths of who I am. I heard God say, I'm not going to let you get away with that. And it wasn't because God was punishing me. No, God was trying to let me get in the space going, you are better than this. And even though you have chosen to be less, I am always going to call you to more. And I just sat on that curb and I was just crying because I felt like the old me was being expelled from my soul with every tear. And the guilt and the shame of who I allowed myself to become was being expelled out of my soul. And, and I sat on that curb and I said, I'm going to leave this moment different. But it has to start with I have to choose to forgive myself. See, before you can ever receive the forgiveness that God longs for you, you have to first forgive yourself. You have to have the grace and the kindness and the mercy that you want to extend to others. If you can't extend it to yourself, you are never going to extend it to another human being. And I, I was on that curb, and I had a choice to make. Will you live in the shadows? Will you allow shame to be your story? Or will you find the power of forgiveness and leave this moment free? See, in Colossians chapter 2, Verses 13 through 14. I love the language that God's trying to help us understand what happens when we give him our sin, when we give him our shame. It says, when you were stuck in your old sin dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slight, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant, canceled and nailed to the cross. See, I, I love this moment because, right, we, we live in a moment right now of cancel culture where everybody wants to cancel everybody. You cancel. You had that tweet when you were seven years old, canceled. <laughs> right, you listen to that song, it had that lyric, canceled. Right, you, you cut me off on the 405, even though we're going 12 miles an hour, canceled. We just want to cancel, cancel, cancel. What I love about who God is, God's not interested in canceling people. He is interested in canceling sins. He's interested in canceling debts. He's interested in, in, in canceling the very things that are weighing on us and saying, I want to set you truly free. Because he says the slate has been wiped clean. He said, there's a new future that's waiting for you. It's just simply one choice away. But we still don't get it. We, we don't believe it, right? Here's another passage. Psalm 103, verse 12. It says, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. I love this. Right? Make some noise if you live on the west side. All right? Tell me the last time you went east of La Cienega. You don't. West side, you stay on the west side. Right, any east siders? Make some noise. Right? Tell me the last time you went to the beach when family wasn't in town. You don't venture that. As far as the east is from the west. See, this is what, he, what he's trying to help us understand. He's like, imagine as far as Santa Monica is from San Bernardino. Like, I want you to feel the chasm, feel the gap. You think that I'm taking record of your wrongs. You think that I have a scoreboard of all the times you've messed up. You don't realize when you give it to me, I cast it as far as the east is from the west. There's literally, you cannot get any further. Those two points will never meet. And then even I think of of like kids' birthday parties. And, and our kids, anytime they're at a birthday party and there's balloons everywhere, our kids go bananas. It's insanity. And they're, 
like grabbing balloon after balloon, and they tie them to the wrist. And, and then every single time we have that moment where one of the kids, they trip and they fall, or the tie breaks, and the balloon all of a sudden starts floating off. And the kid would just, no. <laughs> Daddy, the balloon's gone. And, and, and it's, it's okay. It's gone. There's nothing we can do. But I said, here, let, let's just, let's stand here and let's just watch the balloon. Let's just, let's watch it until we lose sight of it. And, and then we just make it a game. And every, we just start staring at that balloon. Do you still see it? Like, yeah. And we just watch as it drifts further and further and further until eventually it gets so far we no longer have an eye on it. See, that is what God does with your sin. See, that is what God does with your past. Is it is as if it is a balloon filled with helium. He lets it go and it is gone forever. But here's the issue. We are complicated people. And what God does with our guilt and our shame, what God does with our sin is he releases it and he lets it go. But what we do is we keep it as a boomerang. And it's like, why does this thing keep coming back? No matter how far I throw it. You didn't know you were getting sound effects at church. Huh? <laughs> and you throw it. It always comes back. It's because you have to change the medium. Until you switch it from a boomerang to a balloon, it's always going to come back. It's going to come back in your relationships. It's going to come back in your career. It's going to come back in your dreams. It's going to come back in your future. It's going to come back in every arena of your life because you haven't placed it in the full hands of God. Because in his hands, he cast our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Why do you keep having a conversation in the past with God when he's trying to talk to you in the future? And I love in this moment with this woman who has been paraded in front of this crew, her worst moment in the public eye, the moment when guilt and shame and brokenness could have buried her. Well, it says, but Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. There's a bunch of moments in the scriptures that I would just have loved to be there for. Like I would have loved to be there when David slayed Goliath and just the moment that that would have and not just the future of Israel, but in the future of humanity. I'd love to be with the shepherds when they walk into this barn and there's a baby and what they had been told would be there was there, and the, the Savior of the world had been ushered into the human story. I'd love to be there when Jesus is being arrested and Peter cuts off this guy's ear to defend Jesus, and Jesus picks up the ear and like reattaches it. Like, that would have been dope to see. But I would have loved to be here at this moment with this woman who in her worst moment, Jesus doesn't cover her nakedness with clothes, but he covers her shame with grace. And I would have loved to be in this moment when it says that Jesus stooped down and he begins writing on the ground. I, I want to know what he wrote. How about you? Like TMZ is everywhere. How is TMZ not there documenting this moment? Like, what did he write? What did he write in the dirt that, that it says that they all had stones, they're ready to stone her, but whatever he wrote in the dirt, they all left. And it says the oldest one's first, and, and there's thoughts that maybe what he was writing in the dirt 
was their sins, was their shameful acts, was their brokenness. And it's really hard to condemn someone else when you see the, your own mess in front of people. But we don't know. But I, actually, I love that we don't know what he wrote because it keeps in line with the character of God. That even though they came to condemn her, even Jesus is like, I'm not going to let anybody know the conversation we're having. Because even at their worst moment, Jesus didn't want to call them out. But he did want to call them up. And this is how he calls us up. See, it's about the posture. We talk all the time, right? We have a phrase in our language, in our culture, don't stoop down to their level. Right? First Lady Michelle Obama, you know it. When they go low, we go high. That's a posture. That's an understanding. You don't stoop down to someone's level except Jesus all of a sudden flips it on its head. Because in the passage, it says that he stoops down. He begins writing on the ground. And then, it, and then it says he straightens up to let her know no one is here to condemn you. I'm standing with you. See, maybe the first step to you creating space for the power of forgiveness to take over your life is that you have to stoop down in the posture of humility where there's nothing that is beneath you, where there's no one that you cannot extend that kindness to and that grace to and that forgiveness to. And Jesus models for us what it looks like to be a person of character. It's that you stoop down to the lowly places. Because if God can teach us anything, it's that there's no place that is too low for him. And I just love that he writes in the ground, and it even says that he writes in the dust. Because here's what God does not do. He does not write your sin and your shame on stones. He writes it in the dust so it can disappear. And maybe you're here, and you have been holding on to stones that say you're less than. You've been holding on to stones that, that say you're broken. You've been holding on to stones that say you're bitter and you're angry and you're resentful. And, and you've been holding on to stones of your past. And you don't know why you feel so heavy. It's because they were never supposed to be written on stones. They're always supposed to be written in the dust. And maybe today, God's trying to have the first conversation to let you find the freedom that only comes when you trust Him him with everything. You trust and ask that he would forgive you of your sins. He would forgive you of your past. He would forgive you of the wounds. Because if you will allow the God of the universe, if you will allow the love that comes from Christ alone, if you will receive the forgiveness of his death and his burial and his sacrifice. I promise you, you'll begin to discover the ability and the power to forgive those who have wronged you, those who have betrayed you, those who have wounded you, those who keep you chained to the pain of your past. And Jesus is trying to set you free. But it starts with one choice. Will you allow him to have complete mastery over your soul? We allow him to wash you clean. We allow him and his love to do what only he can do. And when you allow the love of Christ to take over from the inside out, it begins to create a new you. And that new you begins to create a new future. I want all of us in this place to bow our heads and close our eyes. Maybe that's you today. If you're here with us in Hollywood, 
you're listening online right now in one of our communities across the world, but you're here and you know that you're holding on to bitterness. You know that you're holding on to resentment. You know you're holding on to fear, to your failures. You just keep punishing yourself over and over and over again because because you're not who you feel like you should be, or you're not as successful as you should be, or, or you feel like you can't figure out how to change, you can't figure out how to, how to do this thing called life, and you're just, you're heavy. Maybe for you, the, the shift that gets to happen in your future, and the shift that you long for in your life begins with the shift in your mind where you stop seeing yourself through your eyes and you, you start seeing yourself through the eyes of God who tells you that you don't have to do anything to earn his love. Who's reminding you that he does not see you for your past. Who's whispering truth into your soul that you were worthy of his love and you were worthy of his sacrifice and you were worthy of his Life, you are worthy of his death, and you are you're worthy of all the things that your soul longs for. If you're here and you're ready to finally trust Jesus with everything, then I want to lead you in a simple prayer right now that could change your future forever. Just tell him if you're here and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, say, Jesus, I give you my life. Just tell him right now, between you and him, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm done letting the guilt and shame rob me of my future. I give you my life, Jesus. I'm done letting other people's woundings and betrayals mark me from this moment forward. Jesus, I give you my life. And it's with those words, you have an unfair exchange with God. You give him your life and he gives you his back. But his life is filled with freedom. And his life is filled with grace. And his life is filled with joy and wonder and beauty and mercy and hope. His life is filled with all the things that you haven't been able to discover on your own, but have just been one choice away. If that's you. And you prayed that prayer without hesitating, without overthinking it. If today you said, Jesus, I give him my life, I want you to raise your hand right now so I can pray for you. Beautiful, I see you so fast. Beautiful, hold it up high because this is a marker for you. This is a new you being unleashed. This is you saying the guilt and shame no longer has mastery on me. Jesus, I give it all to you. Anyone else? Boy, one more moment, because Jesus will always fight for one more person. I see you, girl. He sees you. Beautiful. Father, I pray for every person who has their hand held high. I pray for every person who's crying right now. I pray that the, the tears would be a release of their past and that they would receive the joy of your freedom. They would receive the power of your grace. They would receive the beauty of your life. Jesus, we thank you for every person. I pray when they walk out this room, they would have an extra pep in their step. I pray when they walk out of this room, they would have a smile on their face. And when they go to work, people around them would say, what happened to you? And they could say, Jesus is what happened to me. We thank you, Father. We love you. We are overwhelmed by the gift of your forgiveness, by the gift of your grace. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. And that's all this in your name. Amen. Wow. That talk was so beautiful and such a gift. There are so many people in this room this is a sacred place right now because there's so many of you who raised your hand and I could tell that it was, some of it was a struggle, but you are so deserving of that new life that God has given you. And we're so excited to celebrate that life with you. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the church. Yeah. What I love is when you accepted Jesus, you also accepted his forgiveness. And there is a, um, 
a gift that we want to give you, and that is the Bible. There is a team out in the back patio that are waiting to meet you. We want to hear your story. We want to give you a hug. We want to um, know your name. So make sure that you take that next courageous step to just go out there and say hi. Um, and they have the best gift to give, which is the scriptures, which is a book full of people just like you and me trying to do life making mistakes and then getting up and doing it again. But there is so much um, goodness inside of the words of Jesus that will help you along the way. It will be like a, a post guiding post for your life. So make sure you get the scriptures. And then the same way that you gave your life, people gave their life to Jesus, is when we give, that's us saying yes to Jesus every single day. Because we're saying yes, we want to build the church with you. This doesn't, this place mosaic doesn't happen by accident. It happens by so many faithful people that say, I want to be obedient with Jesus and I want to give my tithe, my hard earned money, my 10% to the church where I know that so much goodness happens. So I'm going to ask the um, offering team to come down. We had the most incredible thing two weeks ago. Pastor Kim and MEI did a fundraiser to build houses in Malawi. The goal was to build 10 houses. And in doing this fundraiser, we had invited dancers to come to be here on this stage and dance their life, you know, that had them, I don't even know what I'm saying, passion on this stage, their sweat and tears and everything because of their joy of dance but they also believed in this mission of building these houses. And because of that, we were able to build 10 houses in Malawi. Well, I love that when we give together, we're not only just building this house, but we're building houses for other people. We have a local impact and a global impact. And that's where your generosity and your gift goes to. So there is many ways to give. One of them is um, there'll be envelopes on your seat. You can place cash in if you ever actually have cash. But you can place that in that envelope and place it in the bucket. Or you can scan the QR code in the back. And this way you can give. You can even choose to be a recurring giver and saying, I am trusting God with my tithe. I'm trusting God with all my life. So you can pass the buckets. I love that the buckets is a symbol of our life. That we get to choose to give more than we receive. And I receive so much in this community, but I love to be a conduit of good. How about you? I wanna be someone that says, no, I wanna be someone that gives because I believe that other people matter. And I want my life to have a greater purpose. So let's choose, ask God, like, what is it that I need to do? What's those shackles I need to get let go of that's stopping me from being someone who is a person of generosity, who gives and is obedient in their giving? Um, we're so, we love you so much.